Hello, this is Jackie Jones and this is Module 2 in Lecture 8, Best Practice for Legal and Professional Skills. This module is looking at just best practices generally um, with some challenging aspects that we find um, as we fulfil our role as legal practitioners. And um, two of the challenges that come to mind is that of capacity and also people um, from cultural and diverse um, linguistic backgrounds. So um, sometimes we may not have come across um, people with capacity issues, for example, or if we do, we don't know quite how to engage in a best practice that enables them to have access to um, justice and their legal rights. So um, there's a common misunderstanding and that's set out there um, on slide five about um, why we get into to problems with people, that we you know, dress, space, time, for example, people where English is their second language. So it's very important that we know and understand how to use communication in a constructive way. We live in a multicultural society which is rich and full of all the benefits of people from differing cultures. And so we need to understand um, how they can all be embraced and engaged and having access to the legal system. One thing that um, I think is very important to, to bear in mind is that what we as a person think is an appropriate way to communicate to someone isn't necessarily uh, the same for everybody. Invading someone's personal space um, can be very intimidating and can impact on someone's willingness to talk to you as their legal advisor and to um, open up and so you can have an understanding of what their problem's all about. The use of silence is also one that differing cultures will have differing, differing responses to and importance of. And also eye contact, looking at people directly in the eye. So it's, it's very important to have that awareness as to whether there needs to be a best practice approach to communication with um, people from either culturally um, diverse backgrounds who have um, language as, as an issue, or it may well be a capacity aspect. Words and space, and there's a slide there talking about how words and um, uh, can in fact have very different meanings. I like that slide there about the cross-cultural communication where one, um, one hand movement can be an insult in Brazil but in the UK and the USA it's okay. So again just be mindful that it's not um, holistically the same approach throughout countries and throughout people. Um, that slide's a little bit blurry on slide 8, but hopefully you'll be able to read it just to get uh, a flavour as to why this can be such an important area and how we need to be considerate of um, people's needs and expenses. Another aspect that uh, you might not quite have um, been mindful of is the concept of time. I know um, I've done a little bit of travel through um, uh, the Pacific Island countries and time has a whole new um, dimension than what it does here in Sydney. I remember when my family and I went to Fiji, it seemed as though there, there was a Fiji time in comparison to um, how we might have things happening here in Sydney. So just be mindful that uh, people with cultures can have differing notions of time, the importance of time. Um, I'm a person that likes to be on time um, and I think that that is also linked to my days of litigating and the importance of being on time um, and how that flows through. Interpreters and translators are a very important component of uh, people having access to justice and having the ability to understand what is going on. Um, everyone has the right to appreciate and to have um, uh, just make sure that they know from their perspective what's happening. I was speaking to my sister this morning and she's a teacher of the deaf and she was involved in a mediation with a student 
and um, there was a word used and she asked the deaf translator what the deaf translator, um, how, the, how that translator described that word, what was, what was the, the method that the, that translator used. And so being mindful that sometimes words can have differing meanings and can have differing interpretations for people and it can um, be important as to ensuring the correct uh, translation or interpretation is always given. So when we look at a best practice for people from uh, cultural um, and ling linguistic diverse backgrounds, um, have an understanding and um, a respect for people from all walks of life um, and understand that even though you have a knowledge and appreciation of what their legal problem may be, that needs to be communicated to them in a way that they understand. Importantly, seek assistance from interpreters um, when um, required and uh, certainly I would always encourage people to use an interpreter that is accredited, not a family or friend, and I know that that can be a challenge at times, but certainly um, one that, as from a professional point of view, um, always have someone that is accredited. Now, another um, aspect of challenge for us as lawyers is capacity. And this um, is actually an interesting one because it goes to the, the heart of who is the client and what is the retainer all about. And capacity can be affected by um, numerous factors and they're set out there on the lecture slide. There's no um, single test, so to speak, and that causes some um, differing aspects. But what um, is really important is for you to be thinking about do I have a concern about this person's capacity? Why do I have a concern about this person's capacity? What do I need to address? What do I need to get? What do I need to explore to address my concerns about a person's capacity? And I think it's sometimes very true when we have older clients um, because it might not seem apparent that they have an understanding, but maybe you need to think about, well, are they actually hearing what I'm saying? I don't know if any of you have a relative um, who has a hearing aid, for example. My grandmother had a hearing aid, but she didn't want to turn it on because she didn't want to use the batteries. So whilst she had the hearing aid, it was of no use because she wouldn't turn it on and use it. So again, we need to just unpack who it is that's opposite us, um, what it is that we're wanting to achieve, and if it is that we're wanting to obtain instructions from a client, we're wanting them to have an understanding of their legal problem and the solutions that are available, we need to ask some questions, we need to explore whether there is a disability of some type, whether their vagueness can be explained simply by the fact that they don't have um, a device such as a hearing aid um, that has uh, been turned on, or it might be that they've been ill and, um, and that they're not feeling well and that they might need to be seen by a medical person, or they may have had a fall and they don't want to talk to anyone about it. Very important that uh, that's explored so that, again, there's no um, advantage taken of such clients by relatives, friends, other members of the community. We're there to ensure that their rights are protected and uh, we need to, again, um, be mindful of um, how we can go about that. So um, slide 14 just has a number of uh, factors for you to identify that could that you might want to appreciate the various um, barriers that can exist um, and might have that as a checklist as the when you're going into practice you might 
um, be able to use and have it as okay well am I worried about some type of mobility or, or their social isolation for example or their dependency and this is a very interesting one as we see a lot of older people now coming into the community are they very dependent on a carer and it's the carer that's bringing them in to have the world changed it's the carer that's bringing them in to um, organise the sale um, of their home. Um, what's happening there? Is there a relative that we need to consider? And so when a, a client's um, capacity is in doubt um, or you're concerned about it, again, the New South Wales Law Society has an excellent resource um, for all of us as legal practitioners and I would encourage all of you to um, to embrace that and to have um, that as a ready reckoner if you are um, seeing people that there is a, a capacity issue. Starting point, what is the flashing light? What is your concern? Why do you have that concern and what do you need to address your concern? It may not be that the person is under the um, un, is, is suffering undue influence, for example. It may be that they um, the diminished capacity isn't an issue. It just might be that they can't hear you. But then again, um, what do you need to establish that? What do you need to identify that they are happy with the instructions that they're giving you? And that all does filter back to who is the client and what are you being asked to do? And is that client the one who's capable of giving you instructions? Now this is a um, fairly detailed flowchart. I've just included it. Um, this was taken from a paper by Tom Cohen back in August 2014 facing the challenges of assisting older people in New South Wales. Um, those of you who might be going to work in smaller practices and you might be exposed to dealing with older people um, might find this a, a helpful tool. So when we have a look at that, um, how is it that we as lawyers fit into this ability to facilitate access to justice? Um, do we need to change the legal culture uh, as to how we behave? And importantly, as lawyers, do we need to be resilient in our role because it is one um, that is quite challenging? So importantly, I think that you need to be mindful that there is a role of the pro bono lawyer out there and sometimes we need to assist those with no equality before the law. There's no obligation to engage in pro bono but maybe as you're reflecting on this, should there be? Should it be a mandatory obligation for all lawyers to do one pro bono matter a year? Just one. Um, would that be part of a CLE, for example? Would that be a requirement for our practising certificate to say not only have we done the so many hours of um, continuing legal education, but we have acted for and appropriately um, advised and uh, directed a client and achieved an outcome, if possible, for a client off offering pro bono services. So I think that that's a, an interesting component for you to reflect on particularly as you are just about to start your career in the legal profession there are certainly um, commercial firms who um, or I should say big firms who do have pro bono sections and that is a benefit because they can get government work because firms have a um, they can say well we do pro bono um, it does foster a positive public image and there's also, for my, for my part, a level of satisfaction of being able to help an individual that is not as fortunate as what we are, um, that is having challenges getting access to the legal system. And it might be just um, being um, understanding, um, directional with maybe a self-represented litigant, not give it necessarily giving them legal advice, but maybe directing them to appropriate um, uh, avenues that they might be able to obtain some assistance um, or you might be able to provide some time by doing some work at a community justice centre. But uh, some food for thought and uh, as you're coming to the end of this uh, to this subject um, be interesting to, I'd be interested to hear your feedback on that. And that's the end of module two of this lecture. Thank you.